Hello, and welcome friends from across the globe to our most recent session of the Wharton Ready Livecast series. In this series, we bring you the very best of Wharton faculty research and insights to help us move forward, considering issues confronting us in the public health, political, and strategic arenas. It is my pleasure to be with you today. I'm Sue Wharton, and I lead the team that works with clients in our tailored business portfolio. Today, we are pleased to welcome Jerry Wind, speaking on the relevant topic of creating opportunities in a time of crisis. Jerry's extensive research on mental models and business model innovation is relevant to all of us during these times. Thank you again for joining us today. Jerry Wind, it is my pleasure and honor to turn the controls over to you. Thank you, Sue. It's a delight to be with you here. And uh, the, all of us are concerned about the current crisis. Are we going to kind of go back to normal? And what I would like to do uh, this morning is to discuss with you the opportunities that the current crisis actually offers for us. We're all familiar with the current situation. So let's go to the essence of the word crisis. So in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters, danger and opportunity. John D. Rockefeller had a famous quote that said, I always try to turn every disaster into an opportunity. And Winston Churchill is believed to have said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So what are the implications for us? Given the crisis, there are really three things we have to do. We have to cope and survive the crisis. But two, we have to capture the opportunities the crisis offers us. And third, we have to anticipate and prepare for the next crisis, because it's unlikely that this is the last crisis that we will experience. So our objective today is really focus on point two, which is how do we capture opportunities in times of crisis. I'm going to discuss with you 10 guidelines for discovering and creating opportunities. Uh, I will stop after the first five uh, to address any questions or comments you may have, and then we'll continue and we'll have again at the end uh, a little time for uh, questions and answers. So the first uh, guideline is really the need to challenge our mental models. Um, viewing the current situation as a short-term necessary evil that we should try to leave behind us as soon as possible and return to our comfortable past is totally crazy. Uh, the challenge that we have is how can we use the current situation to accelerate long overdue changes? Just think about the fact that schools and all schools and universities are closed and moved to online education. To move away uh, from this experience and after the crisis to go back to the old way of teaching, that, that does not make any sense. Or think about the uh, the way we're communicating now using Zoom and other platforms, to ignore this in future communication and just go back to the old way we communicated or sold does not make any sense. How do we incorporate in it? Um, so fundamentally, what well, we have to ask ourselves the question, given the experience we've had in the last few months that seem to work, how do we incorporate the lessons from this in the new mental model that will be required when we're going back uh, to work after the, the crisis. Uh, the second uh, guideline is the importance of speeding up the digital transformation and the creation of the needed digital infrastructure. The shutting down of the physical world and the shift to the digital world, just think about stores, museums, universities, theaters, all require a strong digital infrastructure and definitely the need to accelerate the digital transformation that we have been involved with. It also offers an opportunity to enhance our digital capabilities to capitalize on existing trends, such as the real-time personalized experience that consumers are seeking. The third guideline is the importance of creating new business opportunities to leverage the crisis. Um, today, we know that uh, People are afraid, uncertain. Uh, there's issue of lack of trust. How do we creatively address it? 
how do we take advantage of the new opportunities that emerge? There's a great example. Carlo Ratti, who is a famous designer, designed an intensive care pod within a shopping container for hospitals called it Cura. It's based on open source design and try to address the current challenge we have. Uh, so in addition to the obvious areas that uh, lend themselves to opportunities, all the areas that people are looking for, uh, for product and service that they cannot get, let's explore what else can we do to try to generate new opportunities that the crisis created. The fourth area is the need to re-examine the talent strategy and adapt open innovation. Uh, reassessing primarily uh, the, to what extent your employees do have the necessary 21st century competencies. It's a great opportunity for every organization to examine the talent pool they have. Uh, it's known that uh, the talent is typically distributed normally in organization. Let's take those at the bottom of the distribution, ask the question, can we upgrade them? Can we improve them? Uh, and how can we augment the needs for uh, 21st century uh, competencies? At the same time, there is a huge opportunities for engaging in open innovation. Uh, I'll give you an example for the open innovation. Think about software development. Uh, the top coders in uh, software development uh, have a track record that well documented of about 10x the productivity of an average programmer. And these top coders really have no interest in working for the average company. They work for NASA, they work for Google, some other exciting companies, or they'll work for themselves, be independent. And uh, the advantage of this, and there are a number of groups like top coders or Innocentive and others that aggregate some of these top talent. So if you have a problem, you can actually send it to them, send or the competition, and the, the smartest people uh, out there who may have actually solved the problem from another discipline may then respond to you and help solve the problem. It's known based on a lot of research in the area of open innovation that most of the problems are being solved with people from other discipline, not the discipline where the problem is. So if it's, for example, your Eli Lilly or some of the other big pharmaceutical companies that use open innovation regularly, you will uh, find the solution to your problems typically from people who are not from the medical profession. Uh, in general, the other advantage that you have with open innovation is that you're paying only for results. So not only are you getting better talent, more diverse talent from different areas, but you're getting actually uh, uh, talent that can address the problem, may have actually solved the problem already. And the experience with over thousands of studies in open innovation suggests that you're getting the results four times faster and eight times cheaper than if you do it in internally. And keep in mind, you're paying here only for results. You're not paying for all the experience that your average talent will have to do internally. So huge implication of, as to the talent strategy that you have, both in terms of do I have the right talent? Can I engage more open innovation? And uh, something that every one of you should actually start considering. Uh, the fifth guideline will be to undertake an idealized design process to guide merger acquisition and other areas of opportunities. It's extremely tempting in time of crisis to engage in merger acquisition or acquiring group of talented people uh, for bargain prices. But before uh, yielding to this temptation, let's be careful and design an idealized design process to try to say, what do we really want to be? What's our ideal future? If we were describing our company five years out, what type of company do we want it to be? What will be the, the vision? And once you decide what you really want to be, then go back in terms of almost backward planning and ask the question, does the specific merger acquisition option I'm considering make sense in the context of this? Or can it change, change it? Can we come up with a different idealized design if we capitalize on some merger acquisition activity? Uh, it's known that a lot of the merger acquisitions are not successful for all type of failures, cultural failure and others. but. Let's be careful in this context and try to 
frame it in the context of a longer term vision for the firm. So we covered so far five areas. We covered the, the need to change your mental models, to speed up the digital transformation, to identify new business opportunities, to re-examine your talent strategy, and to identify areas of opportunities by undertaking idealized design process. So let me stop here, and if there are any questions or comments, I'd love to respond to them. Great, thank you, Jerry. Uh, so the Wharton moderator team is ready here to take your questions. We just want to remind you to please use the Q&A function on the right-hand side of your screen to ask your questions, and the Wharton moderator team will relay them along to Jerry here. Uh, so Jerry, a question that came in here is that we know the time is short. Could you elaborate a little more on changing our mental models? Uh, some people just want a little more elaboration on that. Well, the, the time challenging and changing, ideally changing mental models is really key in this type of environment. Uh, and primarily it is, uh, ask yourself the question, if you're involved in university uh, world or schools, you know, what are the implications of the experience we had with online education to the long-term activities that we'll have? We cannot just ignore it. We cannot just go back to the old way we talk. Or think about museums. Uh, there are two types of museums out there. There are museums who very actively engage their audiences from day one with continuous programming. If you think about the Getty, the, the Met in New York, if you think about the Barnes Institute in Philadelphia, they engage an amazing range of activities uh, to, with their audiences. And the audiences are not only the local audiences that typically can come to the museum, but actually global because the, the, the web is global. Uh, for them to go back after the crisis and tell the curator, just continue as always and design the next show in the galleries is crazy. You know, they have to start asking the question now if you're giving direction for the curators is, the next show you're preparing, prepare it both for the galleries and for the global audiences that you can start attracting. So the idea here is to use the opportunity here, the experiences that we had in the last few months, and say, how does this change fundamentally the way we think and operate? I hope that this kind of helped clarify. So if this, the sixth guideline is to switch from a shareholder-driven organization to a stakeholder focus one that engages the stakeholders very effectively. The switch from a shareholder driven organization to stakeholder has been uh, taking uh, place now for a number of years. Just think about the growth of the B Corporation. Think about the recent crisis as a result of the, uh, the killing of uh, uh, George Floyd. Uh, in terms of the concern about uh, having a positive social impact, uh, ignoring the kind of trying to resolve uh, the traditional kind of racist uh, virus that we have had. Uh, so there increasingly the recognition that we cannot just focus on the traditional kind of business model that says let's maximize long-term shareholder value, and we have to move more to asking the question, and how do we do at the same time address the needs and objective of our customers, our employees, our partners, our distributors, and society in general? How do we actually impact uh, society to have a, a positive social impact? Just think about the responsible investing, the current effort of starting about uh, reinventing capitalism, uh, or more responsible capitalism. All of them, these are trends that have been around, but we can actually accelerate them at the time of crisis, move faster uh, toward the resolution. And uh, very important in this area is how do we actively engage the stakeholder? My example that I gave before in terms of the museums would be a good one in terms of thinking about how you start engaging your stakeholders. The seventh area is the speed, uh, speeding up the switch to a network orchestrator model. In today's reality, no company can, is, can operate by itself as an island. It's not a competition anymore between company A versus company B, but it's rather the competition between company A and its network 
as against company B and its network. Uh, we've done uh, two years ago a study on uh, different business models, and we identified four types of business models. Asset builders like uh, uh, retailers, manufacturers, service providers like consulting firms, technology creators like software developers or even pharmaceutical companies that create uh, intellectual property. And then the fourth category is network orchestrators like Uber, Airbnb, and others who leverage and network. And then we ask the question, what is the market value as a multiplier of revenue of these four business models? And the chart in front of you shows you the results. Asset builder is about two, service provider three, technology creator four, and network orchestrator, there is a typo here, it is eight plus, not five plus, it's eight plus. And uh, obviously this is all data, it's not the data that represent what happened currently in the market, but it gives you an indication of the importance of network orchestration. And uh, now it's a great time for everyone to ask the question, what are your networks? Every company, even though you, you love the network orchestrator, you have a network of customers, former customers, employee, uh, partners, providers, others. Identify your network and ask the question, how can I leverage them? How can I leverage? How can I engage the, the network? And ideally, how can I start monetizing the network? The eighth area is uh, a critical one. It says if we're doing all the other things that we discussed, how do we ensure that the organization is agile enough and resilient that can address all the challenges we just discussed and they implement the ideas we, uh, we suggested here? And primarily here we have to do is we have to look at all the elements of the organizational architecture, the culture and values, the structure and governance, the processes, the people and competencies, the facilities, the resources, the technology, the performance measures and incentive. Look at all of them and ask the question, how agile are they, how resilient are they to try to allow us to make the changes? Most critical here will be the culture and values. And hopefully, if you'll examine all of the elements of your organization, you'll be able to uh, modify them, change them as needed. We talked specifically about the people before in terms of the talent strategy, but the same applies to every one of the areas uh, of the organizational architecture that we have to address to try to assure our resilience and agility. Uh, the ninth area, is the re-examination of the business model and operations for increased efficiency and challenging the revenue model to identify opportunities for profitable growth. In time of crisis, cash is always king. Uh, how can we reduce fixed costs? How will we eliminate inefficiencies and redundancies? Uh, we found out uh, that most organizations, if they are legacy organizations, have a lot of operations which at one time were needed, but really are not needed anymore, or a fair amount of redundancy of different activities. Well, take the opportunity to examine this, and there are amazing amount of saving. In our research, we found that most legacy companies can save at least 20% of their budget by asking the simple questions, are we doing the right thing right? Or can we eliminate some activities? And also, let's explore opportunities to change the revenue model. Can we change um, the way we are currently pricing our products? Can we change the revenue models? How can we enhance the needed profitable growth? And the, the last item that I would like to suggest is to innovate and adapt the adaptive experimentation approach. Innovation is critical. Everything we talked about requires innovation, innovative thinking in, in terms of new approaches for engaging audiences, new business models, new offering, and the like. Uh, so while we are innovating and ideally will continue the innovation, it's critical that we adapt an adaptive experimentation approach. Only experimentation allows us to identify the causal link between what we're doing and the results we're getting. It also is the way by encouraging innovate experimentation throughout the organization, you're sending a strong message that it's okay to fail because everyone knows that not every experiment will succeed. You're sending the message to the organization that it's okay to fail, try to experiment, be bold, go with more innovative initiative, 
because some of them will really pay off. All the really most successful companies, the Google, the Facebook, the Amazon, are doing thousands of experiments every day. So if you're not experimenting, start adapting that idea of continuous experimentation. And with any one of the ideas we're discussing here, try to design experiments around it and start implementing it. And this will create a culture of innovation, will help you attract more uh, creative talent who would like to work for organizations that are experimenting and will change completely the dynamics of your organization. So if you don't do it, this is really a must. So with this, we really covered the 10 ideas for how can you uh, create opportunities in time of crisis. And let me stop here and answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you, Jerry. So we have a lot of great questions coming in about the different topics that you discussed. Uh, so I'll start just by going over a couple here. So focusing on number six that you talked about here, uh, the stakeholders more than the shareholders, how can mid-level management, um, how can they create influence among the C-suite about the issue? People are wondering about that. It's a, it's a great question. Actually, the question applies to everything, you know, kind of everything we talked about. Uh, my view on this is that every person in charge of their group in an organization, whether you are in charge of a business unit, whether on a smaller group of a brand, try to apply all the ideas we're talking about here to your brand. Uh, if you're lucky enough and top management recognizes this and they're moving the direction of uh, a stakeholder uh, focus, this is great. But if not, start focusing on your customers, start focusing on your employees, start focusing on the ones that are in your area of control. Uh, do experiments in this area, show the results. And then once you'll demonstrate that this is actually working, that you're getting better results, uh, better business results, because you have more engaged employees and more engaged customers and the like, you know, top management hopefully will listen to this and adopt this throughout the organization. Great, thank you, Jerry. Uh, so if some people are wondering about your first three points. Uh, would you rank them in any specific priority level or are they kind of open to any order? Some people just want some clarification on that. I, I think this applies actually to all 10. I think the the two absolute necessary conditions for success in times of crisis is number one, change your mental models, because if you will not change your mental model, if you'll have this old fashioned approach that says, well, let's just go back to the old way we've done things. And then, wow, how, how great that the crisis is over. This is deadly. If this is your orientation, you haven't learned anything from the crisis, will not generate any opportunities. So changing your mental model and asking the question, what can I do? What changes do I have to make to try to incorporate the lessons from the uh, crisis and the way we've been dealing? We and other organizations, don't look only to yourself, look also at other organizations and don't limit this to organization in your industry. Look across industries and ask the question, what can we learn from them? And what are the implications of our MLMA? So to me, this is the foundation. If you don't do this, forget it, go home. Uh, but if you start really challenging your mental model, you realize how absurd it is to just go back to the way things were before without trying to modify them. And the second absolute critical one is the tense point. You have to experiment. Uh, no one can come up with uh, immediately, this is the winning solution. Start experimenting, experimenting with bold ideas, and some of them will work. So these are the two which are absolutely must. Any of the others, you know, your choice, whatever you feel right, given the conditions of your organization, the situation, the competitive environment you're in, select the one that fits the best. And my concluding comment really is going to be, select one of these areas and start experimenting with this and start doing it. Great, thank you, Jerry. Uh, so about number three also, um, People are wondering, how can you develop new business opportunities when it's really hard to network and your firm, um, you know, it's just hard to network really with the new technologies that are coming out. What would you say to those people who are having difficulties with that? Well, it seems to me that given the experience we've had with Zoom, with uh, uh, WebEx, with all the different uh, platforms for communication, it's actually pretty easy to engage today audiences. Uh, People are also at home, you know, kind of they're more available. Uh, and I would suggest uh, seriously to look at um, 
some of the cultural institutions in what they've done. Think about the, Metro the Metropolitan Opera in New York that created the gala with uh, uh, opera singers from like 40 plus countries participating in the event and they got millions of uh, viewers for this uh, gala uh, and uh, changed dramatically, I think, their impact globally, much more than they could have had, you know, just continuing with the traditional activities they had. So uh, I think that today is probably the best time to try to create a network and start looking at what are new business opportunities that the crisis offers us. Keep in mind also in this context, that a lot of the current research on consumer behavior suggests that uh, consumers are not only indicating today that they're going to cut the purchases or delay purchases, especially of uh, uh, non-essential products and services, but many of them are indicating it's an opportunity for them to re-examine their life, to reflect, why are they doing certain things? That's a huge opportunity when consumers are basically asking the question, why are we doing certain things? Why are we buying certain things? Why are we certain type of uh, activities? And the same should be apply, hopefully, through the challenging of the male mouse for everyone who's listening to this uh, broadcast. Thank you, Jerry. So I think we have time for one more question here. But before we get to that, I just want to remind everyone that we will be providing you with a recording to the session. So please be on the lookout for that. I know some of you were asking about that. Um, so, Jerry, a last final question here to kind of wrap it up is that in your career, in your lifetime, you've seen a lot of crises. How do you think this one is fundamentally different? And do you think it will have more of a lasting impact uh, on the world than some, some of the other ones in the past, perhaps? Yeah. Uh... Uh, as, as you know, I've taught at Wharton for uh, 50 years. I've never seen anything at the magnitude of this crisis. Uh, just think about the fact that uh, there were, you know, over 4 billion people who were basically at home globally, uh, and it's a global crisis. So the, the fact that we are, you know, working, most, most people are working from home, uh, that that's a dramatic change in the nature of work. It's a dramatic change in the nature of the workplace, how we design workplaces. Uh, it's something that uh, cannot be ignored. Uh, so I think we'll have fundamental changes. And also the second crisis that we're going through now, uh, which was the killing of uh, George Floyd and the the global reaction to this, uh, this is of magnitude that we have not seen before. Black Lives Matter kind of uh, existed now for a number of years, but I don't think it ever had as many participants from all races, uh, white, you know, uh, Asians, you name it, participating, and especially this level of engagement of the youth. So I think this is really a game changer. This is a magnitude of change that I don't think we have ever seen before. That require, that's the reason I'm absolutely confident in saying you have to change your mental model. Uh, until now, if you read my books on uh, mental model, we always said challenge your mental model because of the changes in technology, in globalization, in the uh, political environment, cultural environment. We always said all these changes require you to challenge your mental model. I think the first time that I'm saying categorically, it's not challenge your mental models. You have to change your mental models to incorporate, to incorporate the new realities we're discussing now with this dual crisis that we're dealing with. Great. Thank you, Jerry. So I'll just turn it back over to you one more time for final thoughts, but we want to thank everyone for their Q&As. It was very helpful, and we thank you for that. So, Jerry, I'll turn it to you for final thoughts. Thank you. So the final idea is what I mentioned before. Select one area of opportunity and design an experiment to test it. Uh, I think uh, ideally it will involve challenging your current male model. Given the way you challenge a male model, ask the question, what should I do differently? Identify an area and design experiment and run with it. And ideally keep safe, healthy, and enjoy designing your future. Because what you'll do today in terms of cap capitalizing on the opportunities the crisis offer can change your future is going to determine your future. And if any of you have any further questions on this, uh, feel free to uh, write to me uh, uh, through my email. And I hope that this was helpful and all of you will 
just start doing something along this line. Start experimenting. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, thank you, Jerry, for the impactful session and the deep discussion on capturing opportunities during this time of crisis. We'll keep at the forefront your 10 ideas, leading with your changing the mental models. You shared so many key insights, and it's always a pleasure to hear your ideas. Our next session will take place on Tuesday, June 30th at 10 o'clock Eastern time. We have a real treat for all that join. Nancy Rothbard, Chair of the Management Department, and Jeff Klein, Executive Director of the McNulty Leadership Center, will be speaking on work motivation and engagement in a work from home world. And finally, if anything you've heard today is something you would like to explore about bringing to your organization or you as an individual, visit our website or reach out to anyone on the Wharton team. We look forward to hearing from you. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Thanks again and um, be safe. <laughs>